Hello and welcome to another An Old Man Watches and today I'm going to be talking about Battle Beneath the Earth from 1967 uh, and uh, this movie is uh, set in you know the modern day or the 60s um, as it was then obviously uh, so the modern day for the period it was released and it starts in Las Vegas where uh, an apparently crazy man uh, is pressing his ear to the sidewalk and ranting they're down there like ants um, that's pretty unusual behaviour, so naturally enough, the cops pick him up and pack him off to a sanitarium. However, this apparently crazy guy has friends in the military, and he persuades one of them to come see him, telling them he's got you know, very important news for them. Uh, and when they oblige him, he expounds a theory that enemy forces are digging their way beneath the United States in preparation for a subterranean sneak attack. The friend, naturally enough, isn't buying what this guy is selling. At least... Not until strange seismic events start happening in exactly the places that the apparently crazy guy said they would. It's investigating time! And sure enough, it turns out that rogue elements of the Chinese military are burrowing under the United States with a plan to stick nukes, well, everywhere, basically. Uh, and so begins a secret subterranean war, packed with crazy gadgets and antics aplenty. So... Other than a deliciously absurd premise, what does this bit of wackiness have going on? Well, I think we have to start by talking about racism. And actually, the good news here is that for all that the Chinese are the villains of the film, uh, Battle Beneath the Earth is relatively free of any overtly racist caricatures, certainly compared to other media. Uh, if you look at this against the depiction of Chinese characters in something like the Charlie Chan films of the 30s and 40s, oh boy, those movies were problematic. Or, to more, use a more contemporary uh, um, comparison, there's The Talons of Wang Chang, a Doctor Who serial made 10 years after this one, which is full of white actors in yellow face makeup and situates all of the Chinese characters as stereotypes, coolies and tong gangsters. It's it's It's... A very problematic Who serial. Now, to be fair, part of the lack of overtly racist stereotypes here is that the Chinese characters are pretty much all nameless enemies who exist to be to kill or be killed. Ultimately, mostly the latter, of course, uh, in the film's action sequences. And alas, sort of the one exception of a, a named Chinese character with much face time is a white guy in makeup. Um, but you know, it could it could be a lot worse. Is my point. Um, why Chinese villains? Um, you know, um, obviously, if you're la used to later media, um, Soviet Russia was much more prevalent as a, a threat in in films, particularly through the the you know late seventies, early eighties. Um, and I think um, this is a factor of the timing. Uh, the People's Republic of China had actively supported North Korea in the Korean War and was actively supporting North Vietnam as this movie was being made, um, and quite probably in the early to mid-60s, it was seen as a more aggressive danger than the Soviet Union. Uh, a year or two later, as Sino-Soviet relationships broke down, US-Chinese relationships slowly grew less hostile, and the bad guys in movies changed accordingly. This is a thing that happens over time. You know, I remember after the Berlin Wall fell and we, you know, people stopped using, stopped using Russian bad guys. There were a whole lot of British bad guys for a while. Um, I guess because why not? Uh, but yeah, so I think yeah, it's a factor of its time as to who the villains were, and it's it's not as bad in its depiction of them as it could have been, which is you know fortunate to say the least because it could have been really really bad. Secondly, um, uh, it's worth mentioning that this film um, includes a huge amount of footage of the Las Vegas Strip presumably to disguise the fact that despite being set in the United States and headlined by American actor Kerwin Matthews, uh, who also appeared in Jack the Giant Slayer and uh, The Seventh Voyage of Sinbad, um, it was made almost entirely in Great Britain. Most of the supporting cast are British or from Commonwealth countries like Bermuda. The director was Irish. Um, and it appears to have been something of a personal project for executive producer Charles F. Vetter, who wrote the story and screenplay under the screen name LZ or LZ Hargreaves, uh, and who co-founded a production company to finance the film. Um, it also appears to have been his last project in the film industry and the only project that his production company ever made. Um, so... I don't know that it was a financial success for him, shall we say. Uh, but yes, it's a British movie uh, full of British actors, despite the fact that it, it very tries very hard to convince you that it is in, set in the US. Uh, and finally, 
Uh, if you've ever thought to yourself, you know, the only problem with Roger Moore's Bond films is that they aren't goofy enough, then Boy Oh Boy is, beyond the, is, uh, is Battle Beneath the Earth, the movie for you. It's completely gonzo in all elements of a story with science that runs on pure, pure plotanium. Uh, I mean, you know, let's start with digging transcontinental tunnels from China to the US. That is an absurdly massive project. It's a 6,000 mile or 10,000 kilometer trip, all of it under the Pacific Ocean. So you're going to have to dig deep. Parts of the Pacific Ocean are, you know, six miles deep. Um, you know, you're going to have to go deep. Um, and then once you're under the US, you're going to have to burrow to all of your target sites within it. And, you know, the United States is not a small place. It takes five hours to fly from one coast to the other. Um, this film uh, presents all of this being accomplished by a truck-sized machine equipped with some very bright lights while a bunch of guys walk behind it. Did they stroll the whole way to the US? Because that's pretty impressive. Um, even before we start asking questions like how are they getting food and water? and air, for that matter. I mean, ventilation is a huge challenge, even for much smaller tunnels than these ones. The film, of course, deals with all of these questions by ignoring them. Uh, but then the film also appears to believe that the vital tool for jury rigging a nuclear bomb is an Allen key. Um, so I guess it's a good thing there are so many Ikeas in the world these days. We're all well-placed to deal with any rogue nuclear devices we might happen to stumble across. Just, you know, pop down to your local blue and yellow store, grab, a, grab any old flat pack, pull the Allen key out, job's done, nuclear device disarmed. Now, if it sounds like I'm bagging on this film, well, I am a bit. But let me let me be so let me be clear. I do kind of love how deliriously daft this movie is. It is complete nonsense, but it's fun nonsense, or at least I found it fun nonsense, and I enjoy it probably far more than it actually deserves. So that's Battle Beneath the Earth from 1967. Next time, we're staying in the same decade, but we're going for a much more serious and critically acclaimed film, uh, 1966's A Man for All Seasons. So that's next time. In the meantime, thanks for watching this, this video, and I hope you enjoyed it.